to you, your host, Susan Barger from the FAIC. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, this is our last webinar of the year, and so keep an eye on the website for uh, what's coming up in 2018. Uh, the very best way to keep informed about what's going on with us is to join the announce list. It's only two or three messages a month, and it's not a chat list. So um, if you're not on it, please join it. And you can follow us on Facebook. You can like us on Twitter. and uh, Or like, or, yeah, you know what that is. And if you have a question and you want an answer, there's an army of young conservators that answer questions. So feel free to send in questions to the discussion forum, and uh, you'll get an answer quickly. Um, and it, on the discussion forum, people ask about um, how they can be kept up to date. And so once you sign into the discussion forum, you can click on email options, and then you can decide how, how you want to be notified if there's something that's going on. And also, uh, from time to time, we're asked about closed captions. We have closed captions on most of our webinars. We add them after the webinar because they're more accurate. So um, if you see a closed caption sign uh, like this, or if you see this, you can click on this link. It takes you to the ARC YouTube channel, and then you can click on the closed caption, and you'll get it. So um, that's available for you. And probably all of the, the webinars through this year will be captioned before the end of the year. You can always contact me. Uh, this is my email address. And... Coming up in 2018, we're going to have something on strategic planning in January. Um, two webinars in February, um, one on security, one on the much promised webinar in Ivory. And there's going to be one on globes coming up, some on emergency planning. So keep an eye out for what's going on. Now I'm going to turn this over to our speaker for today. That's Alice Carver Kubik. And um, so take. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, my name is Alice Carver Kubik. I'm a research scientist at Image Permanence Institute. Uh, my background, my education, my master's degree is in uh, collections, collections management and preservation. And uh, I originally came to Image Permanence Institute to work on Graphics Atlas. If you're not familiar with Graphics Atlas, it's a um, photograph and print identification and characterization resource. It's online. Um, it's pretty cool. So uh, yeah, check that out. Um, but now I'm, I'm doing that and I'm also doing some other areas of research, which is part of what I'll be talking about today. Um, okay, well, so my task today is to give you the big picture of storage environments for libraries and archives. So if you've ever stood in front of this painting by David, its impressive size is really almost overwhelming. It's a big picture. I'm going to try not to overwhelm you or to overwhelm myself in introducing the big picture of environmental management. However, I have to warn you, there's going to be lots of graphs, but don't worry, we'll walk through them together. Much of the information I'll be sharing is based on research we have done at IPI, Image Permanence Institute. We are an independent, not-for-profit, not university-based research lab. We're located at the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. We are a recognized world leader in the development and deployment of sustainable practices for preservation of images and cultural heritage. And we do this through a combination of research and education um, and um, sort of consulting and training and things like that. Uh, so what I'm sort of presenting today is sort of a culmination of all, all, the, all that we've done in terms of looking at environment. So this slide is really just an outline of, for the presentation, so what, I'm, what I'll be talking about. By reviewing the types and causes of decay, we are reminded of why environment matters. 
Next, I'll discuss what a preservation environment is, followed by a discussion of the research behind our recommendations for certain environmental parameters. I'll then offer some strategies for maintaining a sustainable approach to environmental control. And finally, I'll give a sneak peek into what questions we still have and how we hope to answer them. So how do collections materials deteriorate and what causes them to deteriorate? There are three types of decay, chemical, mechanical, and biological. Most of you already know this, but again, a, a review is always really nice. Chemical decay is sometimes referred to as natural aging. Sometimes it's natural and sometimes it's induced by environment or other factors. Essentially, it's deterioration due to chemical reactions occurring within the object. It is our goal to slow it down or to stop it. Mechanical decay deals with the physical structure of the object. Some mechanical damage is also induced by environment and some is due to handling of the object. Biological is primarily induced by environment, whether it's mold or insects, other vermin like mice and rats are another issue. Typically, we identify the main causes of decay as light, heat, relative humidity, and environmental pollutants. In managing our storage environments, we focus on managing temperature and relative humidity while paying close attention to dew point. There should be little to no light in the storage environment when it's unoccupied. So these, are, these will be my focus here. So let's start with temperature. High temperature leads to chemical decay. Heat is a form of energy. In order for many chemical reactions to proceed, they need energy to push it forward. Heat causes molecular bonds to stretch and break. Chemical bonds are easier to break at high temperatures and sustained high temperatures increase the rate of chemical reactions. The rate of decay doubles with every nine degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature. So the image that's shown here, I'll show my little arrow. So the image here, um, is really illustrating the ideal gas law, showing the correlation between heat and pressure. As heat increases, the kinetic energy of the atoms increase, thus increasing pressure. The rate of chemical reactions that lead to deterioration follows a really similar model. As heat increases, the reaction goes faster. So as a result, dyes fade, plastics degrade, textile fibers weaken and break, paper fibers also weaken and become yellow. But this type of chemical deterioration is really slow. Relative humidity is a measure of the amount of water in the air compared with the maximum amount of water that can be in the air at that temperature. In short, it represents how saturated the air is with water vapor. Temperature and relative humidity are related. Warmer air can hold more water. So this illustration shows a constant amount of water at different temperatures, which results in different relative humidities. So oh, my, my arrow is not moving for me. Oh, I see. Okay, there we go. So here um, we have the same amount of water, different temperatures. So at 55 degrees, this amount of water equals 100% relative humidity. But at 80 degrees, it's only, what, 42% relative humidity? So the humidity is sort of the ratio between the temperature and the amount of water vapor that's expressed as a percentage. Okay, dew point. Dew point is a measure of the absolute amount of water in the air. It is also the temperature at which the air cannot hold all the moisture in it and water condenses. Sometimes it's referred to as dew point. Sometimes you'll hear the word dew point temperature. It's the same thing. The outdoor dew point and the indoor dew point are the same unless the air is humidified or dehumidified. Dew point determines the temperature and relative humidity combination that you can achieve. So when we look at this um, pretty awesome cartoon uh, that I've actually found on the internet, um, what we see is the temperature is 53 degrees and our dew point temperature is 51 degrees. As the temperature drops, we get closer to the dew point temperature. When our outdoor temperature matches the dew point temperature, we get condensation. 
the air actually, the water comes out of the air. When I was um, practicing this webinar to a couple of colleagues, both of which work in museums and um, curators, collections managers, uh, and when I got to Dewpoint, um, they were both like, yeah, so Dewpoint, um, I never get it. Um, so I thought, okay, you know, how do we, how do, we do this better? Uh, and I thought, well, we experience Dewpoint in our everyday lives all the time. So one really good example is um, in the summer, if, you're, if your house isn't air conditioned, it isn't dehumidified, such as mine, um, if I want a cold drink out of the refrigerator, you know, maybe I'll, I'll get a, um, a cold bottle of soda out of the refrigerator. Within a really short amount of time, the outside of the bottle is wet. And that's because the, the interior of the refrigerator, that environment is much cooler than the environment outside and I'm hitting dew point, right? As the bottle warms up to the, the temperature of the outside air, I cross this, right? I cross dew point right here and I get condensation. Um, another really good example was I was hiking in a, in a state park and um, I, it was really hot, muggy day and I went into an interior space. It was a cinder block structure and cinder block structures are really great for keeping sort of the interior space cool. A lot of buildings in the Southwest are cinder block. So I entered the cinder block structure where it was much cooler inside than it was outside, but the dew point temperature was the same throughout. Remember I said the indoor and outdoor is the same unless you dehumidify. Um, and so when I looked at the walls, the walls were, there was condensation. The walls were totally wet. Um, so we had hit dew point, we had crossed that line. Uh, so, you know, essentially, you just don't want that to happen to you. You don't want that to happen in your collection. Um, and I'll sort of keep going and explain um, how you know when you've hit dew point or, you know, how to avoid this. So t temperature and relative humidity can be measured. No instrument can tell you the dew point. The dew point is a result of the temperature and relative humidity. And this is the factor that HVAC engineers as well as collections managers are really looking at. Um, there are sort of indirect ways of calculating dew point. You can use a hygrometer, which has this polished mirror. And when the mirror cools, you know, you get condensation on it. And then you can be like, oh, there's the dew point temperature. There's psychrometers. There's also, um, you can, you, if you know the temperature and relative humidity, there's a really complicated calculation um, that's, you know, calculus, in which you can calculate the dew point. Um, but, um, you know, the, there's also, oh, here, I also, also want to point out here, this is dew point, right? We have 100% relative humidity. That's your dew point as well, right? That's when the, it's going to condensate out. But anyway, going back, um, yeah, there's all these complicated ways of, of calculating dew point, or you can use the dew point calculator. Um, this is a resource that's free and available online. It's an IPI resource, dpcalc.org. And um, get rid of my arrow here. And yeah, all you have to do is, is dial in your temperature and relative humidity, and it'll tell you kind of what your dew point is. Um, and so, you know, if you're, you're an HVAC engineer or if you're a collections manager or, you know, whatever your job is, you have to pay attention to dew point. Use the dew point calculator. Um, the other one point I want to make out here, or I want to make here, is um, because there's a relationship between temperature, relative humidity, and dew point, if one of these factors changes, the others change as well. So as air heats up, it can hold more water, which we saw in the previous slide. At a constant dew point, when the temperature goes up, the relative humidity goes down, and when the temperature goes down, the relative humidity goes up. So institutions that try to improve conditions by lowering temperatures without really looking at the dew point or the resulting relative humidity may find that the moisture level is much too high for safe storage of vulnerable collections. So that's pretty much what this is showing. Uh, let's say our temperature is 68 degrees Fahrenheit and our relative humidity is 40% and we have a constant dew point of 42. We decide, gee, I'd really like our storage environment to be cooler. Let's drop it down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, look what happens to the, t the resulting relative humidity, right? We end up with 76% relative humidity, um, which is high. 
Um, so as a basic rule, the high, higher the dew point, the harder it is to maintain cool temperatures and moderate relative humidity. Um, this is dew point is typically the limiting factor of mechanical system capabilities. Uh, so hopefully um, you've got a handle on dew point now. Uh, within the handouts that have been provided as part of this webinar, we have a handout that describes dew point. So definitely download that and check it out. Uh, and if you, you know, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. Um, I'll answer all the questions at the end. For the rest of the presentation, I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on water. In most circumstances, water is a really great thing. For your collection, water is the cause of much of the deterioration seen in collections. In thinking about the causes of decay, temperature and water are the most important factors. We're interested not only in how much water is in the room as measured by the ambient relative humidity, but also moisture content of your collection. That is how much water is potentially in the collection material itself. Much of our collections are composed of hygroscopic materials, materials that readily absorb and desorb water, such as paper, parchment, leather, cloth, and photographic gelatin. Extreme changes in moisture content cause collections materials to expand and contract, potentially causing permanent physical deformation. High temperature and acidic environment catalyze hydrolysis, a chemical reaction that is the major that is the major cause for deterioration in organic materials. Hydrolysis is a reaction with water resulting in the formation of one or new substances. So if the relative humidity is elevated and you have high temperatures, that means that there's more water available. The reaction is then accelerated in the presence of an acid. This acid can come from the material itself, like lignin in poor quality paper or um, the sort of byproducts of deterioration in cellulose acetate film. It can also come from poor quality housings or it can come from air pollution. Acid hydrolysis is a concern for organic materials um, like cellulosic materials like paper as well as um, some plastics. Moisture is also the major factor behind biological decay. Mold will grow above 65% relative humidity. Active mold should be taken really seriously it can be absolutely detrimental to collections, really to the whole collection. Um, mold is not temperature dependent. Although high temperatures will absolutely accelerate the form formation of mold, as my colleague Doug Nishimura says, he's got mold in his refrigerator. And admittedly, I also have mold in my refrigerator. Um, and you've probably also experienced mold in the refrigerator. So it just sort of, you know, it's a high, it's a humid space and you definitely don't need high temperatures for mold. So here is the ugly face of deterioration in which water is our main culprit with help from its evil friend temperature. The book on the left is experiencing paper deterioration, likely as a result of hydrolysis. I want you to notice that the yellowing is happening from the inside out. This is common as moisture will penetrate from the edges first. Next, we have mold on photographic, um, photographic material. I believe that's a gelatin printed out print. Um, then we have cockling of a photograph due to extreme expansion and contraction of the material due to water absorption and desorption. Again, we have hydrolysis of cellulose acetate film in our second row. And these last two images here and here are mechanical deterioration due to extremes in relative humidity. So now that we reviewed the types of and causes of deterioration, let's talk about preventing deterioration. Temperature and relative humidities are the factors that we can manage and we can measure. Cool temperatures are better. Relative humidity should be moderate to avoid excessive moisture or excessive dryness. We should always keep an eye on dew point to determine safe temperature and relative humidity combinations. Again, use the dew point calculator. What's more difficult to discern um, is when your collection material feels a change in environment and to what extent does it feel the change? Because water is the culprit for most deterioration, 
Another factor we must consider is managing the moisture content of the collection materials. Like dew point, this can't be measured directly. For a long time, many collection, collection, excuse me, for a long time, many collecting institutions took a static approach to environmental management. Typically, this means keeping conditions at a steady temperature and relative humidity, usually 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity, which is intended really for human comfort. This is a problematic approach for several reasons. The first and most important reason is 70 degrees Fahrenheit is far too warm for your collections. 70 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature at which hydrolysis begins. Again, hydrolysis is the primary form of deterioration for paper, cloth, and other organic materials. Other collections maintain, a const maintain constant conditions at cooler temperatures of 60 degrees Fahrenheit and maybe 40% RH. There is absolutely nothing wrong with maintaining these conditions. This will provide a really good preservation environment for most library and archive collection materials. Maintaining a static environment, however, also uses an incredible amount of energy. In non-temperate climates, the HVAC systems are constantly fighting the outdoor highs and lows in both temperature and relative humidity. HVAC systems are not typically designed for this. The energy usage translates not only to a huge carbon footprint, but also to money. Maintaining constant conditions is really expensive. So again, in terms of achieving the goal of all collecting institutions, providing the best preservation environment we can to help these materials last as long as possible, a static approach at cool temperatures and moderate relative humidity is absolutely fine. However, cultural institutions are facing financial constraints due to a lot of factors. HVAC operations are a big bill for most institutions. I think um, the HVAC bill for most institutions are as much and often more than even staff salaries. So we're talking major money, which I'm sure you're well aware of. So when thinking about how we manage the environment for collection storage facilities, we have several really legitimate concerns. And they are, what are the upper and lower limits for temperature and relative humidity? What is meant by avoiding extremes? What is happening to the collection materials when there is a sudden change in environment due to equipment failure or a power outage? What is happening to the object when we bring it from one environment into another environment in order to provide access? What about slow changes in environments that occur over several months? It's these often unanswered questions that lead us to erring on the side of caution and pushing toward a static approach to environmental control. What I hope to show you is that through our research, we have found that many of these concerns are not as frightening as they seem. Okay, so what is the big picture? I promised you a big picture. Um, sustainability is the name of the game. Because energy costs continue to rise and squeeze the already tight budgets of collecting institutions, we need to figure out ways to maintain a high level of preservation for our collections while saving on energy consumption, which in turn will save money and reduce our carbon footprint. We do this by taking what's called a dynamic approach to environment. A dynamic approach means set points are adjusted seasonally in order to keep spaces cooler and drier in the winter and warmer and more humid in the summer, while staying within the temperature and relative humidity parameters that are considered acceptable for maintaining a preservation environment. Depending on your geographical location and your building envelope, this may, this may also mean nightly and weekend setting adjustments. Some institutions change the set points so to so change like their temperature and relative humidity levels. Um, and some actually shut down their HVAC system during nights and weekends when the building is unoccupied. Um, this can be particularly effective in, in institutions when the collection space and staff or visitor spaces are shared. And we're gonna go more into detail about this, talk more about this. 
But the first thing I want to address is chemical stability. So first thing we need to do is keep our temperatures low. There are safe and risk zones for temperature. Temperature can fluctuate within the safe zone, the green and yellow here. Managing high and low temperature extremes is more important than maintenance of steady temperatures year round. I'm going to say this again because this is really the important point we need to make here. Managing high and low temperature extremes is more important than maintenance of steady temperatures year round. So essentially, we don't want to get here. You know, we don't want to be 20 degrees Celsius, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. We want to stay within this sort of, you know, 55 degrees or, um, or lower. So generally, cooler temperatures are better for preservation. However, some materials should never be in frozen storage. That's, you know, what we have down here. This is our frozen storage. Um, for example, some photographic processes, glass plate negatives, or um, internal dye diffusion transfer prints, more commonly known as our Polaroid XX70, should not be frozen. And uh, paintings, for example, um, should be kept above 54 degrees Fahrenheit. In a mixed storage situation, you want to get your temperatures as low as you can for the collection materials you have. Okay, the second thing that we want to look at is relative humidity. We want to avoid extremes for long periods of time. Um, high relative humidity equals more risk for damage. An RH of 30 to 55% is really good for most collections, um, particularly collections made of hygroscopic materials. Extended low RH below 25% can eventually lead to the loss of, the loss of bound water Bound water is the water that's necessary for the flexibility of objects. And you know, it's, it's actually necessary for the kind of the molecular structure of the object. If we lose this bound water, it'll lead to permanent damage due to brittleness. Um, it can also lead to contraction of the object and you know, possible mechanical damage. Extended periods of high relative humidity, our primary concern again is mold, um, but we can also get you know, expansion and contraction or, you know, extreme expansion. And again, if we have our temperatures high, we have all of this water available for chemical deterioration for hydrolysis. Like temperature, relative humidity can fluctuate within these safe zones, within that 30 to 55 percent. The important thing to take away is to avoid extremes for long periods of time, to avoid 25 percent or lower, to avoid, you know, 65 percent or higher, right? We don't, we don't want this for long periods of time. And I mean like a month or more. Could, because your collection will not actually feel short, isolated incidents. How do I know this? Um, I'm going to discuss some of our research findings that lead to these facts and um, the justification for our dynamic approach to environmental management. Our research, as well as research by other institutions in the United States and in Europe, all point toward adopting a sustainable and dynamic approach to environmental control. And so these are the facts that I'm, I'm going to, to sort of expand upon. Thermal equilibration is fast. Moisture equilibration is slow. Ambient relative humidity will have an impact over really long periods of time. Enclosures help. There is a relationship between temperature, the relative humidity, the dew point, as well as your collection materials. So before I get into sort of expanding on these facts, I want to sort of tell you a little bit about the experiment that we did, um, in which we kind of came, came to these, these facts. So shown here is a graph of a temperature and relative humidity profile used in our experiments. The profile was designed to represent eight hour and 16 hour setbacks. That means that the temperature set point was changed at times when the institution would be closed. The relative humidity profile it was a mirror image of the temperature profile. This is what we expect to see at a constant dew point when only the temperature changes. Um, this will also maintain a constant moisture um, content in the room. Um, so I'm going to actually walk you through this graph. 
So what we have here is, you know, this is our profile. The graph comes from eClimate Notebook. eClimate Notebook is IPI software for environmental management. You can take any data logger, upload your digital data into it, and automatically will we'll graph it for you and also tell you um, when you're at risk for, for deterioration. It'll tell you if you're at risk for mold or chemical deterioration um, and all of that. Um, and this is kind of what the graphs look like. So on the top here, we have our temperature in bold. So the darker color is the temperature. On the bottom here in the lighter red, we have relative humidity. Our temperature scale is over here and our relative humidity scale is over here. And um, at the bottom is, is time. Uh, these experiments were led by Jean, um, excuse me, were led by Jean-Louis Bigardon, research scientist, uh, senior research scientist here at IPI. So when I talk about this research and I say we, I really mean Jean-Louis. Um, what he was interested in was determining temperature and moisture equilibration rates for collection materials. That is, when does the collection feel a change in environment? So data logger, so here's a data logger, um, was placed in the center of books, in the center of stacks of paper, and stacks of photographs that were both matted and unmatted. And that's how we measured kind of what the internal temperature and relative humidity was and how fast they were coming to equilibration. Um, I just want to say that um, the websites for, for the dew point calculator and eClimate notebook are um, also in your sort of resource handout. The photographs and papers uh, were also housed in different enclosures, such as metal-edged box, museum case, and a portfolio case. So we're, so we're testing out different enclosures here as well. So let's look at our first fact. Thermal equilibration is fast. That is, the collection feels a change in temperature pretty quickly. Remember that brief changes in temperature, particularly high temperatures, will not cause your collection much damage. Chemical deterioration is a really slow process. It is sustained warm temperatures that will eventually lead to chemical decay like hydrolysis. The data that's shown here is fairly representative of most collection materials. It takes no more than four to six hours for 90% equilibration. Moisture equilibration is slow. At a constant temperature, it will take a hardcover book on a shelf at least a month before the entire book has equilibrated or fully feels the change in relative humidity. A stack of matted photographs or a stack of paper in an enclosure takes about the same amount of time to reach full moisture equilibration. So here is a comparison of temperature equilibration between the ambient environment and the core of a book. The red square lines are the ambient temperature and the rounded blue lines are the conditions in the center of the book. Notice the thermal equilibration is fast and reaches nearly the same temperature as the ambient uh, with each change in temperature. So again, this red line here is our ambient and the blue line just below it is the book. So you can see that the, the whole book feels that change in temperature almost immediately. It's pretty fast. So I showed this a few slides ago, but it's just a reminder of the profile we used in this experiment. The change in relative humidity mirrors the change in temperature. The temperature is changing from about 20 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and the relative humidity is changing 50 to 30 percent. So again, the top line in dark red is our temperature. The bottom in a lighter red is our relative humidity. It's not always going to be red. They're going to be different colors. Because moisture equilibration is slow, it takes a month or, or longer for a book or stack of photographs to reach 90 percent equilibration. So it won't surprise you that when we put the data loggers in the center of these materials, um, the materials didn't really fully feel the change in relative humidity during these, these setbacks, these changes in temperature. Um, there really there isn't much to show because they, they really didn't feel much at all. Um, but Jean-Louis did look at different kinds of enclosures and how they impact moisture equilibration. 
While temperature cycling did not have much of an impact on the relative humidity levels in the center of the stack, the enclosure type did have an impact on the micro environments in the box. So let me walk you through what's happening. So as you can see, we placed a data logger in the kind of free space within the box. And I know that you know when we store matted photographs or store you know anything, our box is just slightly larger than the materials themselves. We don't want all this free space. But you know for the sake of experimenting and seeing what the microenvironment was happening, we need enough space for the logger. So there it is. Um, over here, what we have is our graph. Um, I want to walk you through the graph. Um, so what's shown is the temperature and relative humidity inside the box. So remember that our ambient conditions mirror one another. Temperature goes up, relative humidity goes down. The collection first feels the temperature change, and this is our dark blue line, right? This is this is the what this logger here is experiencing as the temperature changes in the dark blue line here. Um, and you can see that it's it's basically feeling what's happening. It's pretty immediate. But um, this lighter line, the light blue here, is the moisture, right? That's that's the RH that and the sort of moisture that the logger is is experiencing. What's in that microenvironment? So the temperature increase first causes a really short-term desorption of the materials itself, in which a small amount of moisture, a small amount of water, is forced out of the material. And this is shown as a very brief and very minor increase in relative humidity inside the box. So you see the spike here. As the temperature goes up, we get this very brief spike in relative humidity. As, as, temperature, as the increase in temperature is pushing water out of the materials. Then moisture diffusion takes over and controls the microclimate. That is the ambient relative humidity and time take over. So we see the relative humidity start to drop over the period of time. Um, now, this decrease in temperature here, right? So now the temperature is dropping. Um, it pu pushes moisture into the stack, right? So the moisture is now push being pushed into the materials, causing a temporary decrease in relative humidity in the box. So we see this blip here. Again, the ambient relative humidity takes over. What I want to point out that in looking at these graphs, Pay close attention to the scale, right? Over here is our scale. Um, the change in temperature is causing very brief fluxes in relative humidity, and the relative humidity change is really, really small. It's only a few percent change. Another thing to think about here is while the center of the object is not feeling much um, with the changes in relative humidity, the edges of the object and this print on top is likely experiencing the same conditions as the box's microenvironment shown in the graph here. What is happening is that there is what's called a moisture gradient throughout the stack of photographs, books, or papers. Moisture slowly diffuses through the entire object or stack, right? And so you have sort of more moisture at the top than in the middle. We're going to discuss this more later, but I just want to introduce this idea. Jean-Louis tested several different enclosure types, right? So I showed all of those. And so here we compare the ambient relative humidity, which is the green line, with the relative humidity inside a metal edge cardboard box, which is the blue line, and the museum case, which is red. So notice the relative humidity changes inside the museum case follow the same pattern as the cardboard box, but they're less extreme. Enclosure types do make a difference in buffering relative humidity changes. So again, we can see this blue line is our cardboard box. This is the exact same data we just looked at in the previous slide compared with the museum case, which is kind of less extreme. So Jean-Louis repeated his tests using a more realistic profile in which there was a gradual change in temperature and relative humidity over a period of eight hours. That's the profile seen on the left. Like before, the relative humidity in each profile was adjusted to maintain constant moisture content in the space. The relative humidity profile was the mirror image of the temperature profile. The results of the data from the core of the book are on the right. As you can see, the thermal equilibration, the temperature, is fast and follows the change in temperature of the ambient temperature. 
These are the dark lines on top. Blue is the ambient temperature. Red is the inside of the book. Moisture equilibration is slow. These are the lighter lines beneath, with the red being the relative humidity inside the book. Okay, so also notice the change in relative humidity in the center of the book actually follows the change in temperature and then gradually changing as the ambient relative humidity takes over. So, you know, in short, don't sweat the small stuff. Short-term relative humidity fluctuations are not fully experienced by the collection objects. Short-term temperature fluctuations will not last long enough to cause any chemical deterioration. During the course of this research, we also began to see a dynamic relationship exists between the temperature, the relative humidity, and the collection itself. If there is enough hygroscopic material in a closed space, the material is capable of stabilizing the relative humidity fluctuations otherwise caused by these changes in temperature. Small quantities of moisture are absorbed or desorbed by the collection materials responding to the temperature cycling. Um, and this actually contributes to maintaining a steady ambient environment. So we've already seen this, the temperature changes are pushing moisture in, in and out of the collection. So if you remember um, way back in our definition of dew point, I described a phenomenon that occurs when the temperature is lowered in order to maintain better storage conditions, the relative humidity rises. Uh, and that's what's shown here. Generally, this is true. And this was the basis of our testing profile, right? That the, the RH is the mirror image of the temperature. However, this is actually what's observed in an empty room. So we took an empty, sealed, moisture-proof enclosure and subjected it to changes in temperature only. So what we had was a large acrylic box we put in our temperature and humidity controlled walk-in chamber. After the box was placed in the room, the box was sealed so that the ambient relative humidity was actually sealed inside the box. So now we have this sort of microenvironment that we've created. We then only changed the ambient temperature in the room. We used a similar test profile in which the temperature set points were changed for eight or 16 hours, which you can see here. As you can see, the relative humidity goes up as the temperature goes down as expected. The swings in relative humidity are actually significant. There's about a 14% change in relative hum humidity with every five degree change in temperature. This same enclosure, which is actually imaged here, right? So we have a picture of our acrylic enclosure or that we can seal, was filled with hygroscopic collection materials. So, you know, we have books, we have, you know, boxes that are full of photographs and paper and documents and all sorts of things. Um, when we look at the graph, notice the swings in relative humidity are minimal. Also notice the increase in relative humidity as the temperature goes down followed by a slow decline in RH. The changes in temperature are pushing some of the moisture into and out of the collection. This water is contributing to maintaining a relatively steady relative humidity. So think of it like your freezer. We all know that the more thermal mass, the more stuff we put in our freezer, the more efficiently it runs, right? The less energy it'll take to run our freezer. So we can kind of think of our hygroscopic mass in the same way. The more hygroscopic material we have in the room, sort of the more um, stable our relative humidity is going to be. It, it's a contributing factor. So based on this research and looking at the research by others, we developed some strategies for a sustainable approach to environmental management. We had already seen that setbacks have very little immediate impact on the collection. We felt like these were pretty good strategies, but we really wanted to test them out as well in, in a, a real situation. So spoiler alert, uh, these are pretty good strategies and they work. And so let's look at that. Many libraries do not have relative humidity control, including our university's own library. So we used our own library at the university as a test lab. And the university library was really, really gracious 
to allow us to, to sort of experiment in their collection space um, and in their stacks. So we implemented nightly and weekend HVAC shutdowns for a year. Our questions were, what will the collection feel? And is this a good way to save energy? Our library has five zones, each of which have independent controls. And here's our chart. Um, in zone B here, um, we had no shutdowns, right? So nothing was changed. We had sort of, we had a static environment um, in terms of temperature. In zone D, the HVAC was turned off for up to eight hours. Similar to our other experiments, we gathered data from the ambient relative, sorry, the ambient environment, the core of various materials, um, and the microenvironment, so the different box types. This graph shows the ambient conditions from August to March in zones B and D. So again, no setbacks or shutdowns in B, and eight hour shutdowns in D. D is the orange line and the zone in which the shutdowns were implemented. You can see that there's blips in temperature that correspond to the shutdowns. Um, so if you look really closely here, you know, we have these little, in red, we have these little spikes and drops in temperature. So that's, that's when we were sort of shutting down. Um, but you can also see that the shutdowns had no overall impact over the relative humidity. Instead, the relative humidity follows the seasonal trends. The changes in relative humidity are the same in zones D and in B. While we have seen that moisture equilibrium is slow, the collection materials will reach equili equilibrium with the ambient environment within a month. This graph compares the ambient relative humidity conditions in zone B, where there were no shutdowns, with the core of a book. The internal changes of the book follow the trends in the ambient relative humidity. It doesn't feel short-term changes, but it does fully feel sustained changes in relative humidity. This reinforces the notion that we need to pay attention to extended periods of high and low relative humidity. So we thought that perhaps if an institution did have relative humidity control, implementing a stepped seasonal profile may delay moisture equilibration of materials. We found that, um, we found, what we found was that it can depend on the type of enclosure. The core of the objects in the metal edge cardboard box did reach full equilibrium, but it was delayed. The museum case and the portfolio boxes did a better job buffering the relative humidity. So in this graph here, we have this sort of stepped RH profile where with the seasons, we're stepping it up and down to be drier in the winter, more humid in the summer. Um, the red line is our cardboard box. We can see that it actually does reach equilibrium. It's just delayed. And then here, you know, we have our portfolio box and our museum case, and they never reach full moisture equilib equilibrium to this higher RH. So let's move from our research lab into what we call the wild actual institutions. Some institutions are implementing these strategies for sustainable environmental control. So one of the things the Image Permanence Institute does is we actually have consulting. And so we have a couple of consultants that go out to institutions all over the country and look at the HVAC, look at the collections and help make recommendations for how to maintain um, a sustainable preservation environment. Uh, and so this is an institution with which we consulted. And you can see that in the beginning of the year, they were implementing a static approach, maintaining steady temperatures of about 65 degrees Fahrenheit and relative humidity of about 40 to 45%. This is a really good preservation environment. Um, but mid-year, uh, you know, on, under kind of our consultation, they started a dynamic approach. They implemented nightly and weekend shutdowns as well as seasonal setbacks. The storage spaces are cooler and drier in the winter more humid in the summer and warmer, while staying within the safe limits that we discussed earlier. Uh, and this institution has reported back to us that they have major savings in their HVAC 
in their HVAC bill, in their energy bill. So this is one year's worth of data. And I, I have to apologize, this says one day, it should say one week. So this here is one week's worth of data from the same institution. Uh, and this is from the month of June. Like our experimental data, um, okay, so actually what we're showing are, are changes in temperature, which are the shutdowns at night. So these sort of ups and downs in temperature here um, are, 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 are shutdowns during the night. So like our experimental data, the relative humidity follows changes in temperature. The data looks a lot like the data from the self-buffering test. Hmm, interesting. So as the temperature decreases, the relative humidity also decreases slightly rather than increasing due to this buffering effect by the hygroscopic collection material itself. Notice that the changes in relative humidity, remember scale, are very, very minimal. It's unlikely that the collection is really fully feeling or experiencing these changes in relative humidity. And these two lines are just, um, this particular institution has two data loggers in one space. So this is two data, data loggers in two different places in their storage environment. And again, this should say one week's worth of data. So we still have some unanswered questions. We, we know it takes a month or so for full moisture equilibration, but remember that moisture gradient? What's happening to the skin of the book? What's happening to the thing on top of the stack? We need to better understand the self-buffering phenomenon. And we're also interested to see that if an institution has no RH control, like our library, can we use the hygroscopic nature of the collection to control the relative humidity just by manip manipulating temperature? So the moisture gradient issue. Again, the outside of the object or the thing on top of the stack feels the change in environment first. This graph shows the ambient relative humidity compared to a microenvironment in two different kinds of housings. This is an indication of what the skin of the, of the material is actually feeling. We are currently working on a project that actually looks at the skin or the bindings of bound volumes to determine their response to changes in environmental conditions. We are interested in the rate of moisture absorption and desorption and the amount of expansion and contraction of the materials. This type of research hasn't been done on books yet because books are really complex composite objects. They're three-dimensional objects. Um, and they're usually made with a variety of different materials and also made in a variety of different ways. Um, all of these different materials absorb and desorb moisture at different amounts and at different rates. Um, because these materials are all bound together, they're also restrained. You know, the book is restrained sort of by itself, as well as by the other books on the shelf. And this may increase the strain the book experiences as it expands and contracts. So through experience, we know that books expand and contract with changes in environment. Many of us who work in libraries have seen this expansion and contraction. Vellum bound books are particularly responsive. I've heard stories of binding splitting on books or books flying off the shelf like uh, that scene in Ghostbusters due to changes in relative humidity. Um, so I actually have a video here now that I want to show. Um, I think I need some help, Mike. How do I to get the video up? Um, hmm, okay, the video may not work. We may have a technology fail here. Okay, no worries. I'll see if I can re-upload it. <laughs> I believe you, no worries. It was worries. working two um, hours ago. But essentially, I'll, we'll look at the picture first. So essentially what we have is we have these um, books on a shelf, right? They're, they're laid flat um, just to kind of show the expansion and contraction. And this is in our walk-in chamber. The, the relative humidity starts at 60%. We drop it to 25% and it comes back up to 60%. As the relative humidity drops, these books respond um, and they actually open up. So what's happening is as the relative humidity drops, um, the, the binding, the, the materials contract and it kind of acts as a lever, you know, and it opens the book. Um, and this area down below will show, um, it sort of highlights where the areas of movement are. 
Um, this was a this was a video that was done in MATLAB by my colleague Andrew Lurwell, um, who had kind of started this project. Uh, so, yeah, so this sort of shows the book sort of opening and closing um, as the environment changes. So, the questions that we need to answer is: So what? Is the movement of the books leading to permanent deformation, or are these objects actually fine and they're just responding to changes in environment like they have been for centuries in some cases? So um, this book here and this book here are both vellum bound um, and they're pretty responsive, but they're I think they're both like 18th century books, maybe maybe early 19th century books. Um, and I think they might both be 18th century. So and these books are actually in great condition. There's nothing wrong with these books. Vellum is a really strong material. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we just need to find, we just need to figure out, so what? Um, does it matter? Mike, I'm going to move forward. So um, no worries if we get them to work great. If not, uh, I probably won't cry myself to sleep. Um, so what we're using to determine um, sort of what this, the outside of the book is feeling is a pho photogrammetry technique called digital image correlation. And this is to sort of study the response of the collection's materials changed to relative humidity. The way digital image correlation, or DIC, works is we put a random dot pattern and we apply it to the surface of the test material. So here's our dot pattern. It's random. Um, the materials are then imaged at regular interview, intervals with two cameras, which are set up in stereo. And that's what we, is shown here. We have this sort of apparatus, a tripod with this apparatus. And we have two cameras here and here which are imaging at regular interval intervals. It's hard to say today. Um, these images are then run through a special software program that tracks the movement of the dots as the material expands and contracts due to water absorption and desorption. Um, and that corresponds with the changes in relative humidity. The software measures the displacement of the dots, how far they move, and whether or not they actually move back to the same place. The displacement is then calculated as strain. The software gives numerical data in a spreadsheet as well as a 2D and 3D model of the object imaged. So here's actually our 2D model of these samples of parchment. So with this experiment, we started off by looking at individual materials, completely unrestrained, uh, in order to get a sense of the behavior of the materials themselves before they're sort of bound and restrained. So here's several examples of 19th century parchment. These samples were exposed to three different profiles. Um, actually, they were exposed to a total of, um, I think, five or six, six different profiles. Um, but these are three sort of desorption profiles. Um, all of these profiles, all across the board, start at 50% relative humidity. So in our graph here, we have one profile um, start at 50% relative humidity dropped to 30% RH and then came back to 50%. The next one, we did 50% to 20% to 50%, and then finally 50% to 10% RH to 50%. You can see that with each 10% decrease in relative humidity, the negative strain increased. Negative strain just shows contraction of the object, so positive strain is expansion, negative strain is contraction. So it's just showing you how much it's contracted. Um, and what we can see here is, you know, these pieces of, of parchment or, or vellum, um, you know, it's, they start at 0% strain. And our strain levels are actually pretty significant. We get up to like 3% strain, which, which, is, which is kind of a lot for these materials. But when they return to 50% relative humidity, they relax and they come back more or less to, to square one. They come, they come pretty close to zero. You know, this, this is probably um, not of major concern, this, this tiny, teeny, tiny bit. You know, these are point, this is like 0.01% strain, um, which is not something you would ever actually see. Um, the data can also be output as videos. So here we have actually have a two-dimensional video. Um, and this video is also parchment. It shows 50%, 30, 30%, 50% profile, and the color pattern of this sample indicates the amount of strain experienced by the object, which is shown kind of in this scale here on the, um, on the right side. 
uh, what we found is that the materials initially respond really, really quickly, and then there's a shoulder which moisture diffusion slows down before reaching equilibrium. We can actually see this in when it's graphed out, right? This is the response to moisture change fast. Um, but then as the, um, then we kind of have this slow change as it reaches equilibrium. Um, you can also see that although the strain is larger, thus the amount of desorption is greater as the relative humidity is decreased, then the material reaches equilibrium in the same amount of time, right? We hit this point here, the same amount of time, whether it's 30%, 20%, or 10%. Um, and this is totally expected based on what is known about moisture diffusion. This is known as Fick's law of, of diffusion. So regardless of the jump and change, the, the rate is about the same. Um, I'm not sure if it'll work, but is it, is it possible to bring up the second video? We're getting a uh, security notification okay, stopping no the videos from going um, through. I'm sorry. What you'll see oh, in this video, what you would see is that these pieces of parchment curl up. Some of them like roll up completely and I wasn't even able to get complete data off of them. But once we return to 50% relative humidity, they flatten right back out. Um, now, uh, I, there's still a lot of research to be done here. This is, I have nothing conclusive to say um, other than um, you know, these, be these materials are behaving the way I expect them to behave. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't think 10% relative humidity is particularly good for any of these materials for a lot of reasons, but I think 30% is probably fine. Um, so we just have a lot more to do. This is, this is actually an experiment that's, that's ongoing right now. I'm currently kind of in the two and a half years into a three to four year project on this one. Um, so we're actually on to the sort of second stage. We're looking at bound materials themselves, and we're particularly interested in the um, amount of strain that happens in the spine of the book here, um, because this is where we tend to see damage, is in the spine. Um, and this would be another video, but what basically this is a vellum bound book, and it shows the book as it, as it um, reacts to a decrease in relative humidity. And so the relative humidity is dropping and is doing just what you know, the other books were doing is sort of opening and closing. And again, you can see that this book is actually in great condition besides, you know, the dots that I've painted all over it. Uh, and it, there's really um, nothing wrong with it, but I'm going to see if I can actually induce some damage. You know, what is it going to take to induce damage to this book as well as other books? I have books that are cloth bound, leather bound, um, vellum bound, you know, I have full binding, quarter bindings, half bindings. Um, and so on and so forth. So I'm really kind of in the middle of looking at the books themselves. Uh, so um, I will be speaking about this at the um, AIC conference in Houston. So hopefully by uh, the end of May, I'll have more to say about this data and kind of what it all means. Um, yeah. So kind of moving forward, um, the next thing we really want to explore is, you know, at low temperatures, accelerated chemical decay is not really a big concern. But again, what is a concern is the moisture content of the collection as it relates to mechanical deformation and to mold. Mold, again, will, will grow at low temperatures. Um, our next area of study, we hope, will be to determine how changes in temperature changes the moisture content of the collection. We're not as, as focused on how much the ambient relative humidity, like how much moisture is too much um, in terms of like how high the relative humidity is in the ambient room, but on how much water is in the collection and how much water in the collection is too much or too little. With this, we'll continue to explore the self-buffering phenomenon. There's a lot more research that needs to be done there. We're also interested in how to maintain constant moisture content during times of access by adjusting environmental conditions in storage areas and study rooms. Um, so we actually have written a grant and we're waiting to hear uh, whether or not this project will be funded. Uh, we really should hear any day now, so fingers crossed on that. So conclusions, sorry about all the text. Um, 
Short-term fluctuations are not fully experienced by the collection objects. Depending on your building envelope, um, as well as your climate, shutdowns and setbacks can save money. Again, you know, you, you can shut down entirely, but you know, if you're in Fort Lauderdale, shutting down your HVAC uh, in, is, is probably not the best idea because it's just so humid there. Um, but you can, you can set it back, right? You can, you can change your set points. Uh, this will save you a lot of money um, and it'll, it'll reduce your carbon footprint considerably and will do really no harm to your collection. Um, I, it, it, it'll do so little harm to your collection that I made a typo and typed it twice. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, stepped seasonal RH profile may delay moisture equilibration of your materials. Enclosures help. Um, but, you know, when we say closures help, consider time, space, and money. You know, in managing our collections, we all know that, um, you know, our museum cases are more expensive and they take up more room than our metal edge cardboard box. Um, you know, both are really good housings for our materials, but some are more expensive and take, take more space. So, you know, I'm not advocating for like running out and rehousing your entire collection, but moving forward, this is just something to keep in mind especially for your really sensitive collections. Um, and then, you know, the collections material helps to buffer relative humidity fluctuations and can actually minimize moisture content changes at the center of the object. And I think this is something that we also empirically know, but now we also know through experimentation. When I was in graduate school, one of my professors was saying, you know, if you have a box and it's not full, put mat board in it because you, know, you want to fill up that space, because again, right, you have this sort of um, hygroscopic mass that'll kind of buffer that, that empty space, um, and you'll, you'll get sort of less fluctuation within the box. Your collection really isn't feeling it. Um, so with that said, I really want to thank Connecting to Collections Care for inviting me. This has been an awesome opportunity to share this information, to share our research. Um, uh, I especially want to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities Division of Preservation Access. All of the research I've just, I've just nice. gone through was funded by the NEH. So thank you to them and thank you to you for um, joining me. So I think now is when I answer questions. <laughs> okay. That's right. That's right. And um, I just want to let you know that I will post the uh, YouTube addresses for the videos when I post the recording. So you'll be able to get the videos. Um, okay, so let's start. Um, Linda Best said, we lightly place plastic bags over objects on exposed shelving in the event of water from fire suppression. Is there any positive or negative impact from this practice? Is the percentage of potential deterioration from using plastic greater than the off chance of alleviation of fire suppression? And th there's quite a bit of discussion about this. So if you want to answer that question, okay. we'll go um, into the discussion. Yeah, I, I, there's probably some pros and cons there. I think you're um, creating an additional microenvironment, um, which is okay. Uh, if your relative humidity gets too high, you know, you, the, the moisture will penetrate the plastic eventually, right? I mean, it, it, plastic is not totally uh, like a 100% you know, barrier for moisture. Um, so what I would be concerned about is, you know, you want to have the right microenvironment. So, you, so you know, so you're, by you're sort of accidentally or you know creating an extra microenvironment. So yeah, it probably will kind of add to a buffering effect. But um, if you have too much moisture going on, if there's too much moisture in your collection or too much moisture kind of gets in there, you might have too much water present and you might end up with pockets of mold. Um, we see this sometimes in um, compact shelving uh, where, you know, the um, there's not enough moisture exchange. You know, if the, if the, if the shelves are actually too close together, you're not getting enough moisture movement between the collections and the outside air. Moisture equilibration is a constant thing. It's not like it comes to equilibration and it's like, okay, there's equal amount of moisture in your book as there is in the air. Moisture is actually in constant motion moving in and out, right? 
you do have the same amount of moisture in the book in the air, but it's like it's it's still moving. It doesn't like stop. Um, and so if you can't if that moisture can't get out and it gets trapped, you might actually have a problem. Um, so you just really need to keep keep um, aware of that. You might want to put a data logger uh, kind of under one of your plastics just to see what that microenvironment is, so you're aware of what it is, uh, and, and kind of see what's going on there. That would be, you know, you don't, you know, we advocate for, you know, when you, when you are monitoring, leave your monitor in one space. You don't want to move it around because the point is you want a year's worth of data to see what your environment is actually doing. So you might want to get a couple of monitors just to um, dedicate to putting underneath that plastic sheeting so you know um, what that environment is because you just want to be careful that you're not creating the wrong environment. But um, yeah, I mean that's a good question. But yeah, I, yeah, what's worse, right? Um, a fire and dousing your collection with water, or um, or the microenvironment. Like mold could be catastrophic. But okay, I'm rambling now. That's my answer. <laughs> okay. So so then, uh, Linda Ogle said, "What kind of plastic are you using?" and uh, she said you may want to uh, mm -hmm. consider the ability for air movement, which you covered. And then there was a discussion about using uh, leak detectors. So um, do you have any suggestions on using uh, leak detectors? Or uh, Sarah Dunn suggested one called Lyric Wi-Fi water leak and freezer detector, freeze detector. I don't really know much about that. Um, yeah, about that, about the detectors. I, I, so I, I don't, I couldn't really recommend anything specifically. It's probably not a bad idea to know that your water suppression system is leaking. Like, that would be good to know. Um, <laughs> obviously. Uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't have any recommendations per se. Um, Okay. Uh, Deborah Trupin says, in your ongoing research, can you, will you also look at wood, uh, i.e. furniture or, and or gilded and gessoed objects and composite um, textiles? The short answer is maybe, and I, and I hope so. Um, so kind of the background on Image Permanence Institute, if you can guess from the name, when we were established, our main focus was um, image permanence, right? So looking at mainly photographic and printed materials uh, and, and, and the sort of preservation of, of those objects. Um, and, you know, and we've since expanded to sort of books and paper and other printed materials, library and archive materials. But I definitely feel like, and we've had conversations about this uh, as a group in our lab, that you know, we, we, we are interested and we are kind of looking to expand what kind of materials that we're looking at. You know, I will say that other institutes look at these materials, so, which, so we kind of all have our kind of niches. We look at printed materials and photographs and books and things like that. The Getty is doing a lot of, a lot of work on wood and actually looking at the mechanical behavior of wood, like furniture. Um, uh, the Smithsonian Conservation Institute um, ha has done a lot of work with paintings. Um, and you know, and other people are looking at textiles. But I think what we really need to do is, you know, as a lab, is to look at whatever the people have done and feel if they, see if there's any gaps or see if we can apply our research methods and what we're looking at to some of these objects. So we don't have any plans in the immediate future, but kind of looking into the future, um, this, these are the conversations that we're having. Um, but again, you know, we don't want to redo research that's already been done. You know, maybe it's just a matter of compiling the research. Um, so. Okay, uh, Rudolf Trakel says, we're adding thousands of new items to our Harvard-style module at this time. How would this, I think, how would our collections that have already been acclimated in the facility for a month or more, uh, let's see, there's some words missing. If we test uh, turning off the HVAC units overnight, etc. So how, how would, 
if you're adding materials and you have materials that are acclimated, how would that be affected by turning off Yeah, the I get HVAC? it. Oh, Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good uh, question. Rudolph says be affected. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I'm not sure. You know, I don't know if, if the... So we know that, you know, this sort of moisture diffusion, it's going to take however long it takes, right? Um, no matter how big that jump is. So, you know, it, it doesn't really matter what the environment was that it, where the collections were held previously. You know, when you move them into that new environment, it's going to take how long it's going to take for them to fully acclimate to this new space. Um, so I guess it really depends on, you know, if... If those materials were in like a really dry or really humid space, you would probably want to bring them into an environment, you know, what we what we you know, what we would determine a preservation environment, you know, somewhere in that 30 to 55 percent range of relative humidity. Um, and again, with the same temperature, you know, temperature, like I said, you know, temperature does control the moisture content, right? Temperature matters um, and kind of let them chill there for a while. Um, before kind of moving on with the rest of the collection, you, that, that might be a consideration. I don't know that it would really matter that much, honestly. Like, I don't think, you know, I don't want to overthink it. Uh, I, I don't know that it would really harm the collection. Um, you know, there's a, a theory, which I think is a really valid theory, by another research scientist um, somewhere else that kind of has, it basically says, you know, with, with, with mechanical things, you know, expansion and contraction, if your collection material has already seen 25% RH, has already seen 70% RH, right? Like if it's already felt the extremes, when it feels those extremes again, it's not you're not going to do additional damage to the object. And I, and I very much believe that's true. Um, you know, everything we've done is pretty much pointed to that. So, you know, I don't think you're going to harm your object by putting it into an environment that's kind of within these safe zones. Um, you know, eventually, it's going to have the moisture that it needs, right? It's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be acclimated to whatever it is. I don't, you know, yeah, don't overthink it. I don't think it's that, it's that big of a deal. Um, you know, but I'll, I'll kind of add that to my list of things to kind of check and test, you know, if we, um, for sure, like, I think it's a good question. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of like verify, but I'm not super worried. So I know I hope that helps. Okay. Um, Claudia Rivers says, um, we have experience of this phenomenon, which is things drying out and curling back in El Paso with books loaned for exhibits. Since it's really dry here, some books pulled open so much that they did mm -hmm. not fit back in the box that they were shipped in. And then Brad Breedhoff said, uh, you could, mm -hmm. they need to acclimate to environmental change. And um, Lisa asked, um, do you have any suggestions for acclimating hygroscopic um, materials? Sure, sure I do. Um, so the first thing is to validate, yeah, I believe that. Um, I got a, I contributed to a, a dictionary on photography, and it, when it was shipped to me, it was winter, and the whole cover of the book was bowed. Um, and then I left it on my coffee table, and by spring, uh, it had totally flattened out. And so, yeah, this is a real thing, right? That the dimensions of the book will totally change depending on what the environment is. And I know, you know, in a dry environment, especially, um, you know, what you would have seen in that video is the books like totally open up, right? They totally sort of come open uh, as as the humidity drops. Um, there's lots of ways um, that you can sort of acclimate to the, to the environment. Again, um, you know, you can create a micro environment with um, silica gel. Uh, you know, you could really just get like a um, like a plastic container, you know, and put some silica gel in there and kind of, you know, put them in there. Um, yeah, so I mean, someone says don't shock them with the change. Again, you know, with my with my research, with my my data, it's not looking like it met like that that rate of change. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure how much it matters. There is, you know, when it comes to um, stress and strain, um, basically what happens if, if you remember, um, if anybody ever played with, um, I remember, forget his name. Remember that toy, Stretch Armstrong, right? Stretch Armstrong. And he had like the big old stretchy arms. 
if you yank the arms really fast, they'll break off, but you had to like sort of slowly pull them. And I think that's probably what Brad is referring to with, with you know, mechanical change. If you, if, you, if you pull something really hard and really fast, um, it'll, you know, that it, it breaks. Whereas if you pull it slowly, you kind of get that stretch. Um, but, but one of the things that we see is actually with a really slow drawn out change, we, you actually get um, a realignment of the molecular structure. And so you actually get more permanent damage sometimes with really, really slow stretching and changing. So um, again, you know, part of this DIC project is to look at that and to kind of figure out, does the rate of change matter? Um, does the amount of change matter? And so far, you know, our, um, our rate of change has actually been two hours. It's been pretty quickly. And I'm not um, actually seeing any major damage to books or to anything else, to you know, just pieces of paper or parchment um, yet. So again, I don't want to say anything definitive because I'm still kind of knee deep into this project. Um, I have a lot of analysis to do of the data, but um, yeah, I yeah, I would just say you know, create a microenvironment where you can bring it up. Conditioned silica gel is perfect. Some people use saturated salt solutions. To me, they're they're a hassle and they're messy. Um, I like I like the silica gel. You know, you can buy the sort of conditioned silica gel in a box. Um, you know, make sure that you don't accidentally like recondition it. You have to keep it in a sealed bag, mylar bag. But um, yeah. Okay. Um, Amanda Shield says, "How do we implement and enforce these new standards for temperature and RH?" Many institutions still enforce the 70-50 rule. How do we spread this new standard to all museums oh, and gosh. collecting That's institutions? A good question. You know, this information is not new. This idea of, of um, stepping away from 70-50 yeah. and having a di more dynamic approach um, is something that we've actually been advocating for for like almost 30 years, as well as other institutions in Smithsonian also advocates for it. The Getty also advocates for it. Um, we've had full symposiums, international symposiums held, you know, all over the place. There was, you know, I think there was one in Denmark, there was one held by the Smithsonian in DC um, to show different, different institutions research on this, you know, just like further emphasizing and sort of further sort of proof of the pudding, if you will, that, um, you know, this dynamic approach is fine, you know, and it works. Um, it's almost frustrating uh, to, to kind of be the, this, you know, this sort of handful of people sort of shouting into the void, you know, uh, to say like, no, really, you're fine. And I just think it starts with education, doing webinars like this, where we can show our research, you know, and showing, showing proof, not, don't just take my word for it, just to, to show the data and show the proof that um, a dynamic and sustainable approach is fine for your collection. Um, so it always starts with education, you know, and, and then I think what we need to do is we need to train the next generation uh, of, of, of professionals. So we need this educational message to reach our educating institutions, our, our colleges or universities. And so that, so that when we talk about environmental management in our conservation programs, in our museum and library science programs, and, you know, archives programs, they're talking dynamic. They're not saying 70-50. Um, you know, 70-50 is easy. And that's why, that's why we default to it. It's easy. Like, I don't need to know, like, what my collection is. I don't need to, I don't need to think about it too hard. I can just do it. Um, but the truth is we really have to know our collections. We have to know what the materials are. We have to know how they respond to temperature. We need to know how they respond to relative humidity in order to make the best choice we can for our collection. And 70 degrees is not a good choice. Uh, for most collection materials. It just isn't. It's too, far too warm. Um, and, you know, and, and thinking about dew points is also essential. So I guess that's my answer is just education, 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 webinars like this, you know, talking, talking to others. And then when, you know, when it comes to actually implementing it, um, you know, it's, you have to think about it, you know, think about your geographical location. Again, you know, if you're, if you're in the desert or if you're somewhere really humid, um, you know, maybe shutting down entirely isn't the best choice, um, but you can do setbacks. You can change the set points. Also, you know, think about um, your building envelope. Can your building hold 
a temperature and relative humidity uh, for a long period of time. Um, and these are things that, you know, uh, IPI can help you with, with our consultation. A lot of institutions write grants, and part of the grant is to have us come and consult. We're not the only consultation, you know, place that there is. So, you know, there's, there's definitely other people, but, you know, you can have someone come and help you make these changes. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what, what sort of generally is advocated for. Um, but, you know, otherwise, you know, you could also just try it for a day or a week and see what happens. You're not going to kill your collection in, probably in a day or, or a week. Um, but I would, you know, but I would be a little more cautious and look more careful about it, generally speaking. That's just me. I tend to be cautious. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Um, okay. Um, Katie Hall asks... Is what's your opinion of sealed microclimates for long-term storage, i.e., marvel seal? Oh, I love that in question. Glazed um, and we have three minutes and three more questions. Um, thank you. My opinion is these sealed packages, what you're you know, sort of describing, they're also called sealed packages, are really intended for display and for travel. Um, they often, um, again, the glazing um, is usually acrylic, and it's and it's not going to hold. Like it is permeable, um, and you know, especially at the corners of the sealed packages, we get leaks. So your your sealed package will hold for a period of time. How long? I'm not sure, but eventually it'll fail, and so you need to keep checking it, right? You need to have maybe a moisture you know indicator, one of those cobalt strips inside to check it. Um, they're very expensive to make, uh, and they take up, you know, quadruple the space of the object itself. So, you know, you might want to be really selective of really sensitive materials if you're that worried about it. Um, this is actually a question, this is on my list of research questions, and I'm really hoping in the next couple of years to write a grant to look at sealed packages more in depth and really to see how, how long do they last, what kind of what formula, right? There's lots of ways to make these, like which one's the best. So um, that's sort of earmarked for research. So I'm glad you asked that question because it kind of reinforces my um, need to look ask these questions. Okay. Okay. Evelyn Fiedler says, what if your collection is mixed paper, photo, furniture, textiles, metal? Does yeah, absolutely, your research absolutely. Apply but this, to is where, this is where knowing your collection comes in. You have to kind of look at um, the information on each of these materials and decide um, what uh, kind of what your limiting factor is. Um, you know, what's your most sensitive material, and design your environment for that. So, if you do have materials that really shouldn't be frozen, you you don't want to get too cold. Um, it, you know, mo what you've listed are mostly hygroscopic, except for metal. Metals we can set aside. If you have, it's not a composite object, it's just metal, um, drier the better, right? Metal, metal does not like moisture. Um, but, you know, all these other materials need to be above 30%. You know, they need to be above 25%. They need to be 30% to 55% relative humidity. Um, so that might be, you know, you might just want to err on the lower side of, side of RH if you can. But again, you know, even even a little bit of this stepped RH control will significantly improve your um, your your bill, right? And also, you know, reduce your carbon footprint. Um, you know, with that said, you know, I was told like, well, people are people are mostly concerned about the uh, the money, right? The the HVAC bill. You know, nobody really cares about the environment, but I totally disagree. I think I think people do care about the environment. I people I think people do care um, that you know not only do we have rising HVAC bills, um, you know the amount of, amount of pollutants that we're putting into the air by running our HVAC systems is significant, um, and so you know we can do well by our planet as well as do well by our collections. They they don't they're not mutually exclusive. Um, so you know with your mixed collections you might want to you know err on the side of drier with the metals, but you can still have this dynamic approach. That was my tangent, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, 
Okay. We have one more question from Jessica Lewinsky, and she says, if I have 20, 25 data loggers distributed in my galleries, what's the best way to save the information for it to be accessible and also to be able to review the yeah. volume of data I'm acquiring? Yeah. Um, and then so there be able are, to correlate. Um, several it. software programs in the, on the market that um, allow you to download your data into the software and then it'll spit out the graph and then and then you know with most of these you can actually compare the graphs um, the only one I'm really knowledgeable about is eClimate notebook because that's our software and so I'm just going to talk on that because I know more about it um, so what it what it, you can use any data logger it, it's um, you know, you can just download it into the, into the program. It automatically spits out all of the data. You can compare different locations. Um, you know, you you, you can compare um, to, you know all the different loggers. Um, you can also kind of adjust the scale. So you can look at a year's worth of data. You can look at a week's worth of data. You can look at the day look at a day's worth of data, an hour, right? Um, and so you know, and it also has what we call preservation metrics which take the guesswork out, it tells you when you're in trouble. It lets you know. Um, again, you always have to know your collection. You know, if, if you have a room that's full of metal and it's telling you it's too dry, again, you can, you know, it's thinking, our system's thinking hygroscopic materials. Um, you know, so you, you have to have like a little bit of thought into it, but, um, but mostly it really, it's a good tool that really kind of helps you manage your data and manage your environment. And once you know what your environment is, when you can spit out a whole year's worth of data, if your environment is problematic, if you are hitting those extremes, that's when you could start looking to grant funding to help you with your HVAC system and try to try to get it things under control. So yeah, there's there are other softwares out there, um, software programs that I'm just not as knowledgeable about, but they exist. Okay, so um, please fill out the evaluation. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Mike. Um, everyone have wonderful holidays, and um, we will see you in 2018. So keep looking on the website to see what's coming up. And um, that's it. Thank you. Bye-bye.